The 1920s were an important turning point in the history of the United States. The years preceding the decade were incredibly suppressive. The combination of World War I, the passage of Prohibition, and the outbreak of the Spanish flu pandemic had really stifled the economy, the culture, and in many ways the will of the American people. The 1920s were very much a reaction to that decade prior. Jazz music, speakeasies, cheap bootleg hooch, an explosion of art and literature, and a surging economy riding a wave of soon-to-be disastrous laissez-faire deregulation, all contributed to a sort of cultural rebirth for the young nation. But while many inventions and cultural shifts can be looked at as significant for changing American society, Nothing was presented with as much pomp and circumstance or foreshadowed the coming cultural tensions of the 20th century as well as the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. Before we get into that trial of the century, as it was billed at the time, Let's briefly mention some of the many technological advances of the 1920s. The radio, it's hard to understate the importance of the radio in the 1920s. It became the first in-home entertainment device in what is now a bajillion dollar industry for the first time. Americans now had a device in their homes that could pick up signals being broadcast to everyone. And everyone could listen to the same thing at the same time. Music, uh, precursors to TV shows where they basically had actors reading scripts. Um, they're actually fairly entertaining. Um, I could go on and on about how important a radio was to developing modern American culture, but it's not what we're here for. A second thing is the, uh, the newfound importance of the automobile. Cheap prices, clever advertising, uh, led to a massive increase in the number of vehicles that were owned by Americans. In 1910, there was about five automobiles for every 1,000 Americans. By 1930, it was 217. For reference today, it's well over 800. We're obsessed. And that obsession with automobiles begins in the 1920s. Advances in airplane technology during the decade led to the early development of commercial flights and air mail. Having mail travel not by horse and buggy and then trucks, but by airplanes. The 1920s weren't that long after people would load up the family into the buggy and have a horse pull them across, or, or oxen pull them across the country to go out west. It's not that long afterwards, and now all of a sudden you can go from New York to San Francisco, or from Miami to Los Angeles, in the matter of a, less than a third of a day. Right? A flight across the country takes six, seven, maybe eight hours. It is incredible how much the nation shrunk in the minds of the people because of that technology. The movie industry, Hollywood, uh, really started to make the shift from the early types of movies where they were silent movies with sometimes there was words on the screen but it was just weird music and everything moved too fast to what would become modern movies during the 1920s. The first talkies, the first color film were both used in the 1920s. Those, the 1920 movies aren't very good but many of the classics of American film be, come from the 1930s, movies like Frankenstein. And you can't have those movies without the technology being developed in the 1920s. Along with those commercial air flights comes the first successful transatlantic flight. Charles Lindbergh in 1927 
flies from America to Paris. One trip, one way, non-stop, all the way. Today, we're like whoop de doo You can get in a fancy jet from the US military and fly around the entire globe in a handful of hours. Cool. 1927, this is a big deal. The only way prior to get from the new world to the old world or vice versa was by boat and it would take days at best, weeks at worst. Now all of a sudden in one day someone flew from New York to Paris by himself without stopping. This made Lindbergh an overnight celebrity. He became super famous. And in fact, in the late 1920s, he was probably the most famous person in all of America. It's important to later note, however, that Lindbergh became quite fond of the Nazis and on more than one occasion published articles where he said things like, quote, Civilization depends on a western wall of race and arms which can hold back the infiltration of inferior blood. Ugh. Maybe that's what people are talking about when they say you should never meet your heroes. Also in the 1920s, the first helicopter is able to fly. Scientists revolutionize our understanding of health and diet by identifying multiple different types of vitamins. Anesthesia is first developed, which is pretty awesome if you've ever had to be put under anesthesia, because uh, as not fun as that is, it'd be a lot less fun to be awake while the doctor performed that procedure. In 1928, Alexander Fleming first observed that Penicillium notatum, what would later become the medicine penicillin, had antibacterial properties. 1927, a group of astrophysicists release a paper talking about the Big Bang Theory and that maybe that's how the universe was formed. In 1921, researchers finally identified insulin, which led to our current understanding of diabetes. Previously, type 1 diabetes was a short and quick death sentence. Today, with proper application of insulin, people with type 1 diabetes basically live normal lives and have a life expectancy of over 65 years. And my personal favorite advancement from the decade uh, comes from a man named Edwin Hubble. In the second half of the 1920s, he figured out that 1. Other galaxies exist. 2. He created an entire classification system uh, to understand and to organize those other galaxies. Uh, we still use that classification system with just some modifications to this day. He then identified and categorized 46 different galaxies and found evidence to show that the universe was expanding at a uniform rate just a few years after those other astrophysicists said hey this Big Bang idea has got some merit to it. Edwin Hubble independently finds the evidence that proves the Big Bang Theory's validity. In just that handful of years Edwin Hubble completely changed the way that we think about and understand the universe and our place within it, and basically set into motion what would become the modern understanding of astrophysics and physics in general and outer space and all the cool stuff that we know and learn about that every day. As I'm recording this, a rover is about to touch down on Mars. It's not even been a hundred years since Edwin Hubble figured out that other galaxies existed. We didn't know anything beyond what we could see just a few hundred years ago. And now we're reaching out and touching it. So the 1920s saw many changes and clashes to the way America thought about the world. But as I mentioned at the top, one single event showcased this change more than any other. 
In January of 1925, the Tennessee State Legislature passed a law called the Butler Act that made it illegal to teach, quote, any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. In normal speak, you must teach creation, you cannot teach evolution. In May of that same year, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, ran ads in Tennessee newspapers looking for a teacher to volunteer to challenge that Butler Act. Officials in the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, saw a chance to create a significant amount of interest, and hopefully tourism, if they were able to host a prospective trial about the Butler Act. They convinced a man named John Scopes, the football coach, who acted as a substitute teacher for a brief period of time, to play the teacher who would admit to violating the Butler Act. Eventually, three-time presidential candidate and nationally recognized religious political leader William Jennings Bryan agreed to lead the prosecution. And perhaps the most famous attorney in America at the time, known for his leadership in the support of labor unions, Clarence Darrow, agreed to lead the defense. From the very start, the trial is your classic dog and pony show. The entire event will be broadcast across those radios that are now in every American's home. Newspapers from all over the country send reporters to write stories that boldly claim one side or the other is winning, whichever they think will sell better in their city. And eventually, so many people will show up to watch the trial in person that they have to go outside and hold it on the courthouse lawn to accommodate all of the people. The judge for the trial is a man named John T. Ralston, who is incredibly biased in favor of the prosecution. Ralston begins the trial with an opening prayer by a minister, something that is not done in trials. Some reports claim that Ralston believes he has been chosen by God to defend the Bible in this historic case. Eventually, Ralston rules during the trial that the defense cannot call any scientists as witnesses. The trial that has been billed as the great battle between science and religion doesn't include any scientists. Ralston thinks this will be the killing blow to the defense and that the trial will be an embarrassment for the pro-evolution argument. In reality, however, he created the situation that led to Darrow's infamous cross-examination. Backed into a corner and without any way of providing a proper defense, Darrow makes a surprising request that his adversary in the trial, William Jennings Bryan, take the stand as a biblical expert. Ralston doesn't want to say that a biblical expert can't stand in his court. That would make him look bad for the religious argument. And Brian, against the advice of his fellow lawyers, thinks that he will come out looking good in this argument. William Jennings Bryan is, after all, one of the most famous orators or speakers in the country. His pro-Christianity speeches have made him incredibly popular among many Americans and has led to him nearly being elected president multiple times. Taking the stand, however, is a devastating mistake. Darrow begins his questioning of Brian by asking him if he... Well, you know what? I, I think there's a movie about this. Yeah, let's watch the movie about this instead. Given 
considerable study to the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryan? Yes, sir, I have tried to. Then you've made a general study of it. Yes, I have. I have studied the Bible for about 50 years, or sometime more than that, but of course I have studied it more as I have become older than when I was but a boy. You claim that everything in the Bible should be literally interpreted? I believe everything in the Bible should be accepted as it is given there. Some of the Bible is given illustratively. For instance, ye are the salt of the earth. I would not insist that man is actually salt or that he has flesh of salt, but it is used in the sense of salt as saving of God's people. But when you read that Jonah swallowed the whale, or, or, or that the whale swallowed Jonah, Excuse me, please. How do you literally interpret that? When I read that, to big fish swallow Jonah, it does not say whale. That is my recollection of it. A big fish. The biggest fish. And I believe it. And I believe in God who can make a whale and can make a man and make both what he pleases. Now you say that a big fish swallowed Jonah. And he there remained, how long? Three days? And then he spewed him upon the land. You believe the big fish was made to swallow Jonah? I am not prepared to say that. The Bible merely says it is done. You don't know whether it was an ordinary run of fish or specifically made for that purpose? You may guess. Evolutionists guess. You're not prepared to say whether that fish was especially to swallow a man or not. The Bible doesn't say, so I am not prepared to say. But do you believe he made them? That he made such a fish that it was big enough to swallow Jonah? Yes, sir. Let me add, one miracle is just as easy to believe as another. Well, just as hard? It is hard for you to believe but easy for me. A miracle is a thing performed beyond what man can perform. When you get within the realm of miracles, it is just as easy to believe the miracle of Jonah as any other miracle in the Bible. Perfectly easy to believe that Jonah swallowed the whale. If the Bible said so. The Bible doesn't make as extreme statements as evolutionists do. The Bible says that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still for the purpose of lengthening the day, doesn't it? And you believe it? I do. Do you believe at the same time that the entire sun went around the earth? No, I believe that the earth goes around the sun. Do you believe that the men who wrote that thought that the day could be lengthened or that the sun could be stopped? I don't know what they thought. You... you don't know? I think they wrote that fact without expressing their own thoughts. Have you an opinion as to whether or not the men who wrote that thought... I want to object, Your Honor. It has gone beyond the pale of any issue that could possibly be injected into this lawsuit except by imagination. I do not think the defendant has a right to conduct the examination any further, and I ask your honor to exclude it. It seems to me it would be too exacting to confine the defense to the facts. If they are not allowed to get away from the facts, what have they to deal with? Mr. Bryan is willing to be examined. Go ahead. I read that years ago. Can you answer my question directly? If the day was lengthened by stopping either the Earth or the Sun, it must have been the Earth. Well, I should say so. Now, Mr. Bryan, have you ever pondered what would have happened to the Earth if it stood still? No. You have not? No, the God I believe in could have taken care of that, Mr. Darrow. I see. Have you ever pondered what would naturally happen to the earth if it suddenly stood still? Nope. Don't you know it would have been converted into molten mass of matter? 
You testified to that on the stand. I'll give you a chance. Don't you believe it? I would want to hear expert testimony on that. You have never investigated that subject. I don't think I've ever had the question asked. Or ever thought of it. I have been too busy on things that I thought were more important than that. You believe the story of the Flood to be a literal interpretation? Yes, sir. When was that flood? I would not attempt to fix the date. The date is fixed as suggested this morning. About 4004 BC? That has been the estimate of a man that was accepted today. I would not say it is accurate. That estimate is printed in the Bible? Everybody knows. At least I think most of the people know that was the estimate given. But what do you think that the Bible itself says? Don't you know how it was arrived at? I never made a calculation. A calculation from what? I could not say. From the generations of man? I would not want to say that. W what do you think? I do not think about things that I do not think about. Do you think about things you do think about? Well, sometimes. <laughs> Your Honor, he is perfectly able to take care of this, but we are attaining no evidence. This is not competent evidence. These gentlemen have not had much chance. They did not come here to try this case. They came here to try revealed religion. I am here to defend it, and they can ask me any question they please. All right. Great applause from the bleachers. From those whom you call yokels. I have never called them yokels. That is the ignorance of Tennessee, the bigotry. You mean who are applauding you? Those are the people whom you insult. You insult every man of science and learning in the world because he does not believe in your fool religion. I will not stand for that. For, for what he is doing? I am talking to both of you. Wait until you get to me. Do you know anything about how many people there were in Egypt 3,500 years ago? Or how many people were in China 5,000 years ago? No. Have you ever tried to find out? No, sir. You were the first man I've ever heard of who was interested in it. Mr. Bryan. I am the first man you ever heard of who has been interested in the age of human societies and of primitive men. You were the first man I ever heard speak of the numbers of people at those different periods. Where have you lived all your life? Not near you. Nor near anyone of learning? Oh, don't assume you know it all. Do you know there are thousands of books in our libraries on all of those subjects I have been asking you about? I couldn't say, but I'll take your word for it. Have you any idea how old the Earth is? Nope. The book you have introduced in evidence tells you, doesn't it? I, I don't think it does, Mr. Darrow. Well, let's see whether it does. Is, is it this one? This one here? Yes. That's the one, I think. It says, oh, yes, B.C. 4004. That is the Bishop Usher's calculation. That is printed in the Bible which you introduced. Yes, sir. Would you say that the Earth is only 4,000 years old? Oh, no, I, I think it is much older than that. Well, then how much? I couldn't say. Do you say whether the Bible itself says it is older than that? I don't think it's older or not. Do you think that the Earth was made in six days? Not six days of 24 hours. Doesn't it say so? No, no, sir. All right. I, I, I just want to ask a few more questions about the creation. I know. We are going to adjourn when Mr. Bryan comes off the stand for the day. Be very brief, Mr. Darrow. Of course, I believe I will make myself clearer. Of course, it is incompetent testimony before the jury. 
The only reason I'm allowing this to go on at all is that they may have it in the appellate court as showing what the affidavit would be. The reason I am answering is not for the benefit of the superior court. It is to keep these gentlemen from saying I was afraid to meet them and let them question me. And I want the Christian world to know that any atheist, agnostic, unbeliever can question me any time as to my belief in God and I will answer him. I want to take an exception to the conduct of this witness. He may be very popular down here in the hills. Your Honor, they have not asked a question legally, and the only reason they have asked any question is for the purpose, as the question about Jonah was asked, for a chance to give this agnostic an opportunity to criticize a believer in the world of God. And I answer the question in order to shut his mouth so that he cannot go out and tell his atheistic friends that I could not answer the question. This is the only reason, no more reason in the world. Mr. Bryan, do you believe the first woman was Eve? Yes. Do you believe she was literally made out of Adam's rib? I do. Did you ever discover where Cain got his wife? No, sir. I believe the agnostics to hunt for her. You've, you've never found out? I've never tried to find out. You have never tried to find? No. The Bible says he got one, doesn't it? Were there other people on the earth at this time? I, I cannot say. You, you cannot say. Did that ever enter into your consideration? It never bothered me. There were no others recorded, but somehow Cain got a wife. That is what the Bible says. Where she came from, you do not know. All right, all right. Does the statement, the morning and the evening were the first day, and the morning and the evening were the second day, mean anything to you? I do not think it necessarily means a 24-hour day. Y you do not? No. What do you consider it to be? I have not attempted to explain it. If you will take the second chapter, let me have the book. The fourth verse of the second chapter says, These are the generations of heaven and of the earth when they are created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and in the heavens. Now the word day there in the very next chapter is used to describe a, a period and I do not see that there is any necessity for construing the words the evening and the morning as meaning necessarily a 24-hour day in the day when the Lord made the heaven and the earth. Then when the Bible said, for instance, and God called the firmament of heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day, that does not necessarily mean 24 hours. I don't, I don't think it necessarily does. Do you think it does or does not? I know a great many think so. Well, well, what do you think? I do not think it does. You think those were not literal days? I do not think they were 24 hour days. What do you think about? That, that's my opinion. I do not know that my opinion is better on the subject than those who think it does. You do not think that? No, but I think it would be just as easy for the kind of God we believe in to make the world in six days as in six years, or in six million years, or in six hundred million years. I do not think it's important whether we believe one or the other. Do you think those were literal days? My impression is that they were periods, and but I would not attempt to argue as against anybody who wanted to believe it was literal days. I'll, I'll read it to you from the Bible. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Do you think that is why the serpent is compelled to crawl on his belly? I believe that. Have you any idea how the snake went before that? 
No, sir. Do you know whether he walked on his tail or not? No, sir. I, I have no way to know. Now, you refer to the cloud that was put in heaven after the flood, the rainbow. Do you believe in that? Read it. All right, Mr. Bryan, I will read it for you. Your Honor, I think I can shorten this testimony. The only purpose Mr. Dara has is to slur the Bible, but I will answer his questions. I will answer it all at once, and I have no objection in the world. I want the world to know that this man, who does not believe in God, is trying to use the court of Tennessee... I object to that. ...to slur at it, and while it will require time, I am willing to take it. I object to your statement, and I am exempting you on your fool ideas that no intelligent Christian on earth believes. Court is adjourned until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Wow. What a great movie. Uh, the acting in that was superb. Uh, the director, clearly a genius. <laughs> Anyways, that was the actual transcript of what happened on day seven of the trial. That is, that's not Mrs. Ada and I making stuff up. That is pretty much word for word what was said during this discussion. The next day... The jury went into deliberation, and it only lasted for nine minutes. Uh, if you don't know much about trials, that's really fast. And to no one's surprise, Scopes was found guilty. He had, after all, admitted that he broke the law. But in the minds of many Americans, that wasn't the case. William Jennings Bryan talked himself in circles and fully, fully admitted he was intentionally ignorant on many topics. It was a really bad defeat for the man previously known as the Great Commoner. What Darrow knew going in and seemingly Bryan didn't was that that trial wasn't about if John Scopes was guilty. He was. Everyone knew that John Scopes was guilty. He admitted it before the trial even happened. The outcome of that trial didn't mean anything. In fact, William Jennings Bryan offered to pay John Scopes' fine when he was fined for having broken the Butler Act. The Scopes Monkey Trial wasn't about swaying a small-town Tennessee jury, but about swaying the American people as a whole. In that way, Darrow had overwhelmingly won. In any sort of controversial debate, there's going to be some amount of Americans who are going to think that one side won regardless, and another group of Americans who are going to think that the other side won, regardless of how either side looks. It happens every presidential debate uh, that there's people whose minds can't be changed. But this trial is about was about those people in the middle who that are back and forth are sitting on the fence. And those people walked away from listening to this trial on the radio, hearing news reports about this trial on the radio and in their newspapers, and they walked away and said, hmm, that William Jennings Bryan guy kind of sounded like a doofus. He really didn't equip himself very well in that argument. You can see that being the fact that at the beginning of the trial, before the trial started, there were 15 other states that were considering passing legislation similar to the Butler Act. Within six months, 13 of those 15 didn't exist anymore. Their legislatures had thrown them out. They knew they were a bad idea, or at least politically a bad idea. And those two that did pass, along with Tennessee's, not much long later would be thrown out by the, the federal Supreme Court as being obviously unconstitutional on grounds that they very clearly violate the First Amendment. The Scopes trial is a great piece of foreshadowing 
about the culture wars that would dominate American politics for most of the rest of the 20th century and even to this day. The battle between tradition and modernism, new and old, religion and science, and how those two things interact has been an important piece of the fabric of America for decades. Nearly a century later, and we're still having many of these same conversations, and an easy solution doesn't seem anywhere on the horizon.